Since the Arab Spring began a year and a half ago, the Islamic world has been transformed. Or has it? Today on Uncommon Knowledge, one of the nation's leading experts on the Islamic world, the Hoover Institution's Fuad Ajami, and one of the nation's leading strategic thinkers, a founder of Yale's legendary course in grand strategy, Charles Hill. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Be sure to visit us, by the way, on our website at hoover.org slash UK or on Facebook at facebook.com slash UNC knowledge, facebook.com slash unc knowledge. Raised in Lebanon, Dr. Fuad Ajami came to the United States in 1963 at 18. Now a fellow at the Hoover Institution, he has served on the faculties of institutions including Princeton and Johns Hopkins. Dr. Ajami is the author of many books, including his most recent, The Syrian Rebellion. The diplomat in residence at Yale and a fellow at the Hoover Institution, Ambassador Charles Hill served as Senior State Department Advisor to Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger and George Shultz. Ambassador Hill's books include last year's Trial of a Thousand Years, World Order, and Islamism. Uh, Dr. Ajami and Ambassador Hill serve as co-chairman of the Hoover Institution's Herbert and Jane Dwight Working Group on Islamism and the International Order. Fuad and Charlie, welcome. <clears throat> Segment one, the strategic imperative. Charles Hill, in the foreword to the Syrian rebellion, quote, the task of reversing Islamist radicalism and of reforming and strengthening the state across the entire Muslim world is the greatest strategic challenge of the 21st century. All right. Reforming and strengthening the state. Saddam Hussein, Hosni Mubarak, Bashar al-Assad, isn't the problem in much of the Muslim world that the state is too strong, Charlie? What you mentioned is the theme that really has been conducted by the world beyond the Middle East going back to the years just after World War I. And that is when the entire region was brought into the state system, the international state system. A kind of grid of states was dropped across the entire region. And something like um, regimes that were recognizable to the outside world were emplaced there, came into being military regimes, um, autocrats, um, hereditary monarchies, and the effort has been, through a lot of wars and a lot of difficult diplomacy, wherever you look across the entire region, to make those states more responsible, more legitimate, uh, more responsive to their, their populations. Okay, so let me see if I understand that correctly. Up until the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1924, well, actually it's sloppy because bits of it break away sooner, but the Ottoman Empire staggers along until 1924. And up until that moment, the fundamental notion in the Arab Muslim world, at least, is of the caliphate, correct? That somehow or other they're part of a Muslim order. That ends in 1924. Winston Churchill draws up Iraq. Other people draw lines on the map. And the Europeans, in effect, say, you, 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 run this country, this country, this. And now the effort is to turn them into real countries, not arbitrary grids. Is that fair? And that's quite fair. And either they came in as states um, from the start or they were made into mandate mandates where an outside power coming out of World War I would be required to oversee the movement of that uh, polity into statehood. That's what uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict has been about. Uh, to try to promote, as you have heard so many times, a two-state solution. Right. <clears throat> Each one would be a state legitimate and recognized diplomatically in the international system. Fuad, listen again to Charlie's foreword here. Quote, the greatest strategic challenge of the 21st century involves, quote, reversing, reversing Islamist radicalism, close quote. That's more ambitious than the goal we set for ourselves during the Cold War, when the overall strategy through 45 years was containment. Charlie wants us to reverse Islamist radicalism. You may tell me because we're, we both, we both, we're speaking of a friend here. He's, he's gone too far. Charlie's out of his mind basically there, isn't he? 
Well, Charlie is not out of his mind. Charlie is never out of his mind. I think what Charlie, I mean, being a student of, of the Hildian world and what Charlie writes and says, I think he's concerned with teaching these states in the Middle East the rules of the Westphalian system, the rules of the nation state as they obtain worldwide. So it's really about inducting them, if you will, into the state system. And in a way, there's a bridge between the question you asked, Peter, and what Charlie said, because you said, well, aren't these states very strong? Well, actually, these were kleptocracies, the regimes of M Mubarak, the regimes of Bashar al-Assad, the regime of Saddam Hussein. They were different in many ways, but they, at, the, at the heart of it was this kleptocracy system where the rulers were basically bandits. They were, they were both killers, and in the end, they were thieves. They were crooks, like in Syria, for example. Old man Hafiz Assad created this regime, mm -hmm. but his son turned it into a kind of an instrument of theft and plunder. So you have this odd situation where these regimes are merciless, they're tyrannical, but they're not really modern institutions, they're not really modern government. All right. Now, I lack your knowledge also your profundity, but let me try. This is, I'm, I think this is, there's something deep here, so let me stumble into it as best I can. Western history, Arab history. Western history. Athens, 500 BC, you have a functioning democracy. The Roman Republic is succeeded by the empire, but the re Republic contains important elements of democracy, and the empire still it at least pays a kind of lip service to some notion of democracy. In Northern Europe, you've got the all things of the Norwegian, of the, of the Scandinavian states. So you push the Mediterranean world of the West, the Northern Mediterranean, you push Western Europe deep, 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 centuries back, and you find democracy. That's Western history. Arab history, it's just not there. The whole sweep of Arab history over here in Lebanon, your home country, for a few years during the 70s, you get a functioning democracy of a kind, but it probably wouldn't have functioned without the Christian roughly one-third of the country. And so right up until a couple of weeks ago, when the Libyans and the Egyptians held elections, there is just, there is no tradition, no intellectual tradition, no live, there's nothing in Arab history to draw upon. Well, there's an Arab tradition where, as a guest, you're always polite to your host, so I want to be polite <laughs> to you, but there is, there is a kind of, there is a, an argument has been advanced, and innocent people make the argument that the Arabs don't have freedom and liberty in their DNA. And one of the things I liked and supported about the presidency of George W. Bush was his argument that freedom is not, you know, some exclusive property of the Western world. So... When you take a look, for example, at the history of Egypt, you see the Republic of Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. Right. Six, six decades, 60 years, there is no tradition of democracy. But if you go to Egypt in the 20s and the 30s, there was a democratic heritage. You look at Syria under the Assad tyranny, under the Assad father and son, under the Salawi gangs that rule it and terrorize it, and you don't see democracy. But you go to Syria in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, and there were democratic experiments. There were struggling democratic experiments. It just now, when you take a look at what, the Arab, what became in, of the Arab world in the age of authoritarianism and the age of the petro-state, the fact that you have money right. and the state has the money, it looks like a democratic desert, no pun intended on the expression. Oh. But like take Libya, even yep. take Libya, a backwater in the Arab world, even Libya, had a democratic tradition, an argument about politics before the age of Muammar al-Qaddafi. Qaddafi terrorized the country, plundered the country, and one man owned the means of production, to speak, all the wealth accrued to him. So yes, if you take a look at the authoritarian world of today, the Arab world look, looks bereft of democratic tradition, but that wasn't always the case. It's well, important but, also to, yeah, to get, get the uh, I want to get the history right here. Correction because, to what okay. you, how you portrayed it. This really isn't a matter of the West versus the Middle East Arab Islamic world, because what we're talking about here doesn't go back to ancient Athens. It really starts in the early modern period. Starts at the end of the Thirty Years' War, 
and Treating that's, Westphalia. that's the Westphalian, Westphalian system, Westphalian system Westphalian the state system, system. Right. and that is a procedural system. In other words, it's very, very simple. <laughs> you've got to be a state, you've got to adhere or try to adhere to international law, international organizations, you're going to have to follow certain norms like no slavery, you have to have a professional military and diplomatic corps, and that's it. In other words, you follow the procedures, and then if you do that, you can be a legitimate, recognized member of the state, international state system. So my searching around for democratic tradition is beside the point. So it's not, and this becomes, as the centuries go by in the modern era, this becomes adopted internationally. So it's no longer the West. In fact, the United States didn't like this system in the 19th century. We, we were very wary of it and didn't want to get fully involved with it. But eventually, as the 20th century went along, you found that this was the system being adopted all around the globe because it was procedural, because people could see that if I follow the rules, I can be Buddhist, I can be whatever I want to be. I can be socialist, I, or I can be democratic, but I don't have to follow some substantive line of, of thought. So when this is being done after World War I, it's not really the West imposing itself. It's saying to the Middle East, you really have got to get yourself into this system because it's the world system. Or are you going to put yourself at odds with it and adversarial to it? Okay. Um, segment two, Egypt. Population roughly 80 million, which makes it by far the largest uh, in the Arab world. On June 30th, Mohamed Morsi, the candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood, is sworn in as Egypt's first democratically elected president. As we speak, as best I can sort it out, the military has dissolved the parliament, President Morsi has ordered it back into session, and the Supreme Constitutional Court has issued an order saying that President Morsi's order was, in effect, illegal. Fuad Ajami, quote, lawlessness has come to Egypt, and if it is to be rolled back, the army and the Muslim Brotherhood will have to reach a workable compact, close quote. Army, Muslim Brotherhood. Why are those two important? You know, Peter, people think that the army and the Muslim Brotherhood are competing and antagonistic forces. But if you go back to the history of Egypt, if you go back to that magical moment in 1952 when the officer regime of Nasr and Sadat and Mubarak came into power, the original design was a deal between the Brotherhood and the army. And I think Egypt, if Egypt is to find a way an accommodation will have to be reached between Mohammed Morsi having been elected by 13 million people, having the presidency. It's a non pharaonic presidency. This is the first time. I mean, there is hope for Egypt. It elected a working president. Also, it seems to have been a fair election. He, he won by a squeaker. It was a couple of percentage Absolutely. points. Absolutely. He won. Right? There, were, you know, there were 25 million people cast their ballots. He won th 13 million people. Right. And Ahmed Shafiq, who represents the so-called fulul, what the Egyptians call the remnants of the old regime, the remnants of the Mubarak regime, won 12 million votes. And I think Morsi, by the way, a PhD in engineering from the University of Southern California, two sons holding U.S. citizenship, so he's no stranger, if you will, to our land and our norms, taught at Cal State Northridge, again, to throw in some American pieces into his life. He showed some real guts. He basically said, the dissolving of the parliament was an act of judicial overreach. I actually agree with him. Egypt is cursed with a judiciary which is akin to the judiciary of Pakistan, which is a judiciary without any political sense and any political judgment. So he called the parliament back into session, and something interesting happened. The army let the parliament come into session. So there is already the beginning of a search for an accommodation between the army and the brotherhood. All right. This, is, and this can be done. An accommodation can, can be reached, and it can be democratic, and it can be within the international system. Hold on. And I mean, don't even take another breath. Hold on. Bernard Lewis, quote, now this is an interview he gave about a year ago. Bernard Lewis is perhaps the greatest living American scholar of the Muslim world. Quote, I don't know how one could get the impression that the Muslim Brotherhood is relatively benign unless you mean relatively as compared with the Nazi party. In genuinely free and fair elections, the Muslim parties are very likely to win and I think that would be a disaster. Close quote. The candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood 
has won. There was a genuinely free and fair election. The Muslim Brotherhood has won. And now you're telling me that it's not a disaster. <clears throat> I'm saying that it can, the accommodation can be made and it can be democratic and it can be in the international system. But what Bernard Lewis is saying is probably it's a danger that is more likely to happen. And that is the, the example of Pakistan where the government was under Zia al-Haq was military, a military uh, regime, and began to say, we can enhance our own power and our abilities by bringing the Islamists into the government and making an accommodation with them. And they tried that, and we now see what Pakistan is today. The military could not control the Islamists, only up to a certain point. They began to infiltrate the military, infiltrate the intelligence services, infiltrate into the financial situation. And Pakistan had exactly what Fuad is describing in Egypt. It has this tremendously volatile, all over the place, illegal system. So I think that the, the danger here that Bernard Lewis is referring to, I wouldn't go as far as he goes in terms of saying it's an absolute disaster and there's no hope. I think there's some hope, but it's gonna be very hard to prevent Egypt from turning into something like Pakistan and spiraling downward. So why is the situation more hopeful in Egypt than it was in Pakistan? Because the Egyptian army at least has the example of Pakistan. They know the trouble they might be getting into or because Egypt is starting out with at least a free and fair election. There's, a, there's an aspiration to genuine democracy that perhaps didn't exist. Well, fill me in it's here. It's because, in my view, I defer to foot on this, but in my view it's because Egypt in some sense is a real country and Pakistan uh -huh. is a modern concocted country. Fear of Egypt is this... It's been, it's the oldest state, the hydraulic state on the banks of the Nile. It's this urban environment. Old people are Egyptians. The Copts are the oldest ancient community of Egypt. You know, Pakistan is just a gerrymander state. It's chaotic. While Egypt is this, I mean, ultimately, it's a very urban society with a real tradition of Egyptian nationalism. And by the way, I yield to no one in my affection and regard for Bernard Lewis. He's been a friend and a colleague for many years and forgive this person reference, he even dedicated a book to me. So I love Bernard, but I take issue with him on this. On if, if you draw this argument that, that in that hard a fashion, you have an election, you have to honor the results of the election. If you're going to bid farewell to the autocrats and what they represent to Mubarak, to, to Bashar al-Assad and so on, to Saddam Hussein, you have to open the space and opening it up to political Islam is one of the risks we have to run. Segment three, Syria. We're now 16 months into an uprising that has left some 15,000 Syrians dead. Fuad Ajami, quote, the intensifying barbarism of Bashar al-Assad's regime, regime, the massacres and atrocities have given Mr. Obama nowhere to hide, close quote. Now, Fuad, in this book, The Syrian Rebellion, which is not just about the current Syrian rebellion. What I myself as a layman so appreciate it is that you take time to lay out Syrian history. In doing so, you make clear that what is taking place today, there is a kind of understructure of tribal animosities that goes back, let me see, my note, to the emergence of the Alawi tribe in the 10th century. So, why should Barack Obama be concerned with, why is that our fight? You know, Peter, I made my way to, um, in order to write this book because Syria engaged me morally and intellectually and strategically as well. And Charlie could talk about the strategic part. I made my way several times to the refugee camps, the Syrian refugee camps in Turkey on the border with Syria. And I was literally, I went with Anderson Cooper and his team of CNN one, one trip, and you stand there 200 meters or so from the Syrian border, and you reflect on a country, Damascus is the oldest inhabited city. You reflect on a proud country with a great tradition, and you reflect on the barbarism being inflicted on it. People say 16,000 or so Syrians have been killed. We shall never know the numbers until the regime really falls. We have an accounting of the disappeared Tens of thousands may already have been liquidated in Bashar al-Assad's world. 1,200 children have been killed. Women are being subjected to mass rape. There are 27 
torture centers, says Human Rights Watch in, in Syria. There are trophy videos where, they, where the killers and the torturers sell these videos and show what they are doing to proud and decent people. So I don't know what engages us in, in, in Syria. I don't think we, anyone, including myself, or more importantly, someone like Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman, who've really thrown themselves into this debate, no one is calling on Barack Obama to wage war in Syria, to dispatch the Marines to uh, Latakia. What we're calling upon is a form of American intervention that would tip the scales in favor of this rebellion. We can talk in detail. For example, mm -hmm. a no-fly, no-drive zone on the Turkey-Syria border would alter the terms of the fight because the defectors from the Syrian army would now have a place to go to. But the cynicism of the Obama administration was to successfully depict this fight as either boots on the ground or head in the sand. Charlie. Strategically, the context of all of this, all of this uh, I fully agree with, but the strategic dimension makes the fate of Syria really tied with the fate of the entire region and who is going to be the overriding power in the region. The sense there, the declared uh, position of the U.S. is really to pull out of, we pivoted to Asia, supposedly. We're not going to be in the Middle East. We're not going to be doing the things that we did before there. That's created a sense of vacuum so that the bigger powers are now looking at each other. Which of us is going to be the, the overriding power of all of the Middle East, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia? Syria belongs to Iran in some major sense. So if Syria remains under Bashar Assad, which is what it looks like the Kofi Annan mission is trying to do, then that's a victory for Iran. Iran is a power in the region. It has ambitions. It's a revolutionary power in the region. It has connections, surrogates in Syria, in Hezbollah, in Lebanon, in Yemen. It's got connections with Hamas in Gaza. Iran is going to be very, very much strengthened if it survives this challenge of the revolution in Syria. What are the Russians up to? Why are the Russians insistent on propping up Assad? <laughs> the Russian position is um, something taken from the czars and something from the commissars. Uh, the Russian view, and as my interpretation under Putin, is that you survey the horizon of the world and you find a big problem and you try to make that problem worse. <laughs> and that's what Russia is doing. And it's, it's moving in ways that are hard to understand because on the one hand, they're diplomatically looking like they are going to be helpful to the outside world dealing with Syria. On the other hand, they're vetoing the resolution. They're moving warships uh, to the ports of Syria. They're talking about if there's a blockade on Syria, that Russian warships will allow Russian merchant vessels through. Right. All of this, on the one hand, on the other hand, they look different. I think Russia is waiting to see which way it's going to serve its own interests to go. Chechnya, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all along the southern flank, the Russians have Muslim populations, Muslim countries. To greater or lesser extent, they're fabricated, concocted countries themselves, I think, you'd have to say, many of them. So is it at least plausible that the Russians are saying our interest is in order, even if it's order by strongman? We want order. We don't want... We don't, want, we don't want the people on our southern flank getting ideas. It's order, but under, I think ideally in the mind of Putin, it's order under a Russian hegemony that would eventually not be unlike the Soviet empire, which covered all of those Muslim populations. So he's Why not recover that? Now they will say again and again, that's ridiculous. We have no intention whatsoever of reestablishing the Soviet empire. But in fact, that's the way they're moving. That's really all Russians know how to do. I mean, I don't mean, I, and I say that in the nicest possible way, but uh, a thousand years of history, all they really, that's, that's how Russians define themselves as controlling that vast space, right? And they don't have clear geographic borders. Right. Therefore, they have got to be attending to and manipulating and being devious and being threatening all around their borders in order to feel that they've got control over their own national heartland. Okay. So, 
Fuad, I don't, the moral case is compelling. I have no, at the same time though, I feel almost required to say that if the United States, if the trigger for American intervention, and even a minor intervention, even a matter of placing a finger on the scales to tip the scales, if the trigger is human suffering, then there is no end to our interventions around the world. Can I, is it possible to cast the question in hard terms of American interest? If we stay out of Syria, in what way will our interests be harmed? Well, I think we have an interest in, in a liberal international order. We have an interest in a humanitarian international order. And then even take a look at these incredible, incredible borders of Syria. When you think of Syria, you've got Syria borders Lebanon. Lebanon itself is a, is a quilt of nationalities, ethnicities, loyalties. And then Syria borders Israel, again, a very important border. Syria borders Jordan. Again, there is a problem there. Syria borders Iraq. Syria borders Turkey, and we've already seen, and there is Turkey, a NATO member, which has a right to call on other NATO members. I mean, it's the, it's the one Muslim member of NATO already embroiled in the Syria controversy. We can't take time out. We can't say there are no strategic stakes in Syria. There are strategic stakes in Syria. If we really care about the stability of the borders, the stability of these states, we have no choice but to tip the scales, as you, as you would put it. We, have, we must support this rebellion because Bashar will fall. Fall he will. There is no doubt he is going to. But before he falls, my fear is, and a lot of what peop, you know, people who know Syria will tell you, he is going to destroy the assets of the Syrian state. He's going to poison the well completely between the Alawis and the Sunnis. He's going to make it very difficult for his own Alawi community to find a place in a post-Bashar, in a post-Assad Syria. So we, ha we can't take a holiday from history. These borders, the interesting thing is, Secretary Clinton is always talking about these borders as an, as an alibi for not intervening in Syria. I take these very borders as a case for a robust American role. You subscribe to all of that? Even more so, uh, the um, Obama administration has brought forward in a book review in the New York Times of yesterday is redefining America's role in the world, America's power in the world, and the phrase there used was to be modest and downbeat. And if that's the case, if we are pulling out, and that's the way it's seen, it's seen by the regimes and by the rest of the world as though the Americans are now in a very different mode. We are not going to be directly supporting those who are seeking freedom. We are not going to be taking a leadership role. And we're not going to be fighting for the international system. We're going to be more acquiescent to changes in regimes and uh, around the world. And if that's the case, then the regimes that run or will run the Middle East could take it entirely out of the international order as we have known it. And they've got examples such as the so-called China model, which is a different way of looking at the world than we have thought about it since the end of World War II. And that is you have an open economic system in order to become rich and powerful, but you have a closed political system and you don't really subscribe to the international state system of the last 300 or 400 years. If that's the case, then we're headed for a very, very different world. It's going to be something that's not going to be very attractive to us. Allow me, Peter, yes. to, just to follow up on what Charlie said. Without American leadership, without America helping its, you know, the, the, the right forces in the region, in the greater Middle East, look what happened. The Syrians, who have absolutely a zero army, you know, the Syrians themselves called the army, the army in slippers. I mean, this is a pathetic army, a pathetic air force. The Syrians, basically, what they did about a fortnight ago, they shot down an F-4, a Turkish, a, a Turkish plane. And to the extent that we can tell, they shot it in international waters. It doesn't matter whether they shot it down in international water, whether they shot it down on, over Syria. What happens is the Turks give the Syrians a buy because Prime Minister Erdogan is not sure. He didn't get any green light from the United States. He, didn't, he wasn't told 
that in fact we are outraged by the behavior of the Syrians. And the word is that he never even got a phone call from his best bud, Barack Obama. He's gotten 13 phone calls in the past. And all of a sudden, President Obama goes silent when this would have been the opportunity to take it to the Syrians. I mean, if you really want... But, so what I don't understand there, Fuad, I, I, I take the, the argument, but the piece I don't understand is the Turks have a real military. They do. Why does Erdogan forbear to smack the Syrians around? Well, I think because they, he's afraid of the Iranians in the background? What's I, he afraid of? Well, I think it's very complicated. I think his relations with the Turkish military are not excellent. Uh -huh. And the Turkish military is still is still very, very attentive to American desires and to the Pentagon and to American security doctrines. Had the United States said that this really is a sort of, in a way, a trigger for war or a real reason to punish Syria in a very dramatic way, you would have seen a very different Turkish response. So he needs American backing he does. to ensure that his own orders get he carried does. out. He does, he does. All right, segment four. <laughs> It's television, so uh, but, but let me apologize anyway. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iran, all in about eight minutes. <laughs> How's that? No, 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 Iraq. No. Late December of last year, the final 500 or so American troops withdraw. Max Boot writing recently, quote, with violence levels rising and with Prime Minister Maliki increasingly accumulating dictatorial powers, the outlook for Iraq is a good deal less bright than it was a year ago when it appeared likely, this is before the administration makes clear that we will pull out, when it appeared likely that there would be at least a residual American troop presence. Close quote. So after the loss of some 4,000 American lives, untold tens of thousands of Iraqis, and the expenditure of billions, tens of billions of American treasure, we never really did quite pull it off. We still don't have a functioning, stable, safe, democratic Iraq. Charlie? Because we decided with the American administration coming into power in 2009 that we were not going to pull it off. So you have to look at Iraq and Afghanistan uh, together because it's the same situation there. We are doing things. We are active. We have things that can look like the surge. We have operations that are effective here and there but it's a kind of a covering fire for an overall general retreat. And that's what is seen by those in the region, those in Iraq and Afghanistan, as they look at us. The Americans are on their way out. Let them do their things because they will soon be gone. And so we have not carried through on the task. And that didn't, doesn't require combat troops necessarily. It doesn't require a permanent presence, but it means you've got to say we're with you and staying with you as you go toward legitimate statehood in the system. Okay, explain to me. Let's do something. Let's, let's all just take a deep breath and hold hands and jump together and try very hard to make the best argument we can for what Barack Obama is doing. So my question runs as follows. Iraq is in pretty good shape by the time you, Mr. Obama, take the oath of office as president. The huge costs are already sunk. Now it's a relatively minor, I'm, I'm not saying it's cheap, but in terms of military budgets, by historical terms, this is a relatively minor American commitment to keep this thing moving in the right direction. And furthermore, although you have campaigned against the war in Iraq, it's not a war anymore. You can portray it in any way you want to, peacekeeping, mission, nation building. In other words, this won't cost you politically and it won't cost the budget that much. Likewise, Afghanistan, you've got Petraeus in there. Just let him do what he wants to do. He has immense, he gives you political cover. He has so much respect in the country. And again, it's relatively inexpensive in historical terms and by comparison with the rest of the Pentagon budget. And Barack Obama answers, uh, he answers from the argument that has been going on in the American cultural and intellectual elite for 40 or 50 years. <clears throat> and that it's, it's not, hasn't been the majority argument, it's been a minority argument. It is that really the U.S. should never have been doing anything like this at all before. It is our interventions, it's our reaching forward, it's our arrogance, 
it's our expenditure of, of treasure and the lives of our sons and daughters that really have caused one problem after another. And look at what happened under President George W. Bush. Therefore, it's time for us to get out of this business. We can't get out of it by simply walking away. We've got to do it in a rapid but somewhat covered system. Fighting, fighting so retreat. That's fighting what retreat. we're doing now. So intellectually, there is a straight line from the Oval Office in 2012 to, it to Kent State in to the 60s. It to the Vietnam War. Yes. It does. You know, Peter, <clears throat> the president, President Obama, says the tide of war is receding. I mean, this is one of his main arguments. What's receding, if you will, in that greater Middle East is really the tide of American power. And what President Obama did on Iraq was really the triumph of politics over policy. I know Prime Minister Maliki very well. I've spent a fair amount of time of, with Prime Minister Maliki of Iraq. The interesting thing about what President Obama did in a very clever way is he made the Iraqis an offer they could refuse. He basically said, hey, I'm willing to leave two, 3,000, 4,000 soldiers. And he knew damn well that the Iraqis were going to say, we can't accept that small a force because that force can't defend itself, let alone defend us. That's an insult. While, exactly, That's an insult. While leaving us with the burden of being, if you will, leaving Iraq and the Iraqi political class with the burden of being accomplices or collaborators with American power. President Obama knew that if he offered Prime Minister Maliki 20,000 American soldiers, Prime Minister Maliki would have leapt at the opportunity. I think what's interesting about President Obama, and I think Charlie said it so well, I see him as the messenger, the herald of this American retreat. I think he and his coalition, and this is the verdict of democracy in our country, that I think he has sold the American people on the idea that our touch sullies others, that people don't want American power. And look at what's happening in Afghanistan. I mean, we can say Iraq was not Obama's war, but Afghanistan was the war he claimed. He called it the good war of necessity. He, he described it thus. And here's the audit of the American position in Afghanistan. And it was recently spelled out in a brilliant article by the best American reporter of these wars, Dexter Filkins, in a very important piece in The New Yorker on Afghanistan. He surveyed Afghanistan and he said, after 11 years of war, after 2,000 Americans dead, after 16,000 Americans wounded, after $400 billion spent, we are going to leave Afghanistan mission unaccomplished. And when we leave in 2014, there will be no democracy in Afghanistan. There will be no self-sustaining economy. The Taliban will not be defeated and the Taliban will return to power. And all President Obama is doing in Afghanistan is running out the clock, delaying, kicking the can down the road, delaying, <laughs> delaying reckoning until after the election. This is why this year, is a major moment in the history of American foreign policy and in the history of modern world order. Because you can look, we can look back at a particular year, I would say 1947, when the US decides that it will take up the burden from the British of world order. By the and way, we can will, we all agree right now that Harry Truman was a great man? It yes, was Truman. All right. <clears throat> it was Truman. One, one Saturday afternoon, the British Embassy in Washington put an official in a car and sent him over to Dean Acheson and said, we can't do it anymore, over to you. And Acheson went to the president and the president said yes. That's when the American century and the American leadership in world order began. And this may be the year that will be pointed to and said, this is when it ended. So Charlie, I want to get to Iran in a moment, but now that we've started on Harry Truman, Harry Truman, I had occasion the other day to read Truman's speech, and it, you're quite right, it is an astounding story. The British say in uh, February, as I recall, we are withdrawing from Greece and Turkey by the end of March. You have six weeks. And Harry Truman goes before a joint session of Congress and says, we're stepping up. And he says, at several different places in that speech, we are doing this because if we do not, no one else will. It is that notion, we can argue about Franklin Roosevelt's use of it, but Ronald Reagan picked it up, this notion, rendezvous with destiny, that in some way or another, the country had no choice. 
it was big, it was powerful, it could do things that no other actor on the world stage could. And so my question is, is Barack Obama shrewdly reading the American public? They've just had enough. You look at the way England wrapped up the empire after the end of the Second World War, and it's not economic or military necessity, although you could argue here or here or here they were overextended. Fundamentally, what was happening was that the people who ran the country said, we're tired of this. We're tired of this. That's not reading the American public. That's feeding it. Yeah. That's not leadership. If you go to the middle of the country and talk about these things, you don't hear people saying how tired they are, how we've got to pull back or we can't do it anymore. It's, not, it, it, it's a failure of understanding what really is at stake. And that is that the kind of world that we're going to be moving into is one that's not going to be moving toward freedom, not going to be moving toward open trade, not going to be a procedurally based international system. And you can hear the voices, quite intellectual, well thought out, out there now describing what they think the next world order ought to be. And it's not at all like this one. You know, Peter, there's a Turkish intellectual I like, a good friend of mine, and I've been I, as I think, as I said, I've been spending a fair amount of time in Turkey and in Antakya on the Syria-Turkey border. And he said something which really cut to, the, to me. He said, we don't think much about America anymore. We, you know, we, we bulk large in the world in 1947 and et cetera, et cetera. If nations choose to be small and they put forward leaders who will make them small, they will be small. And if nations answer the call of destiny, they answer the call of destiny. It's the, it's the fate of America at this moment that the commander-in-chief doesn't think big, that the commander-in-chief thinks that anything that can be done by SEALs and drones shouldn't be done. But you don't do foreign policy by SEALs and drones. The American people need to go to that moment at the State of the Union where President Obama says to um, Defense Secretary Panetta, you know, with the intention of being overheard, great job tonight, great job tonight, twice he says it to him. What was that great job? We rescued two people from Somali pirates. We rescued two people from Somali pirates. That's not what a great power does. A great power does what Reagan did, what Reagan did in the 80s. A great power stands for international order. A great power does what Harry Truman did in the late 1940s. It's a choice that Barack Obama is doing, and who knows? The public may reward him for that choice. Iran, from a story in the, recent story in the New York Times, quote, in the summer of 2012, this is a, an overview of where matters stand now in Iran, that kind of story. Quote, in the summer of 2012, we're recording this in the summer of 2012, we're talking about earlier this summer, the Obama administration and its European allies imposed sweeping new sanctions that are meant to cut Iran off from the global oil market. Many experts regard this as the best hope for forcing Iran to change its course. In other words, for forcing Iran to forego the development of nuclear weapons. Are you impressed? I'm not, I'm not impressed. The Wall Street Journal had a very interesting piece. It basically told us that all 20 trading partners of Iran have exemptions from the sanctions. All 20 of them have exemptions. The Indians intend to carry on their trade with, with Iran. The Chinese intend to carry on their trade with Iran. The sanctions are deeper than, than old sanctions. I grant you that. But Iran, if, this, if the effort and if the goal of the sanctions is to persuade Iran that the nuclear quest is for naught, that will end in failure. Charlie? Iran really is the leader in... He, they are inside the international system and outside it, and they play that double game as it suits their purpose. And they are a major force for bringing the system down. And the nuclear weapons program is at the heart of this. We have about five points of leverage over Iran, and they can be pretty strong. Sanctions, cyber operations, subversion, negotiations, support for the Iranian op opposition, the military option itself being credible. We don't, because we don't have American leadership, we don't have coordination of those five so that they are putting maximum 
pressure on Iran at one time. So one is undercutting the other. And sometimes we undercut them themse our, ourselves. As Wen Fuad says, we have very strengthening, strong, impressive sanctions on the financial side, but then we, gi we give waivers. Or we, we watch Kofi Annan take his mission to Syria and to Iran, and he's undercutting the other operations, the negotiations that we have going undercutting the sanctions, because we're not coordinating them, so one side is not doing damage to the other one. So therefore, all of these relatively good ways of making Iran change course are not having an effect because there's a lack of American leadership. Contrast, contrast, and again, I'm poking, that's a thought that's actually occurring to me in real time, so I'll stumble as I try to put it to you, Professor Hill. But what you're saying reminds me of the Reagan pressure on the Soviet Union, which was coordinated. There were mistakes here and there, but fundamentally it was coordinated against across the diplomatic and economic and military portfolios. And everyone knew, everyone meaning George Shultz and Charlie Hill at the State Department, Cap Weinberger at State, uh, Secretaries of Treasury, Everyone coordinated because everyone knew that the President of the United States was serious about putting pressure on the Soviet Union as he was serious about very little else. Is that fair? It's fair. You know what the President wanted? It was clear. And it was also being done, it was carried out every morning. There would be meetings and the meetings would, would uh, have a lot of people in them from every relevant branch of the government. And you go around and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And you make sure that they were not going to work at cross purposes. And you would ramp it up when that would be proper. You'd fine-tune it when that would be proper. But there was a coordinated idea of leadership at the top of, of this. And that's not what you Meaning this can be done. It can be done. You're not talking about some idealistic, this can be done if the United States government is serious about it. It can be done by coordinated and active diplomacy. You know, Peter, the yeah. president pretends or claims that he wants to he wants to stop the Iranian push and he wants to stop the Iranian bid for power. He's got one place he can do it before we take up the question of Iran's nuclear drive because the Iranians, the Pakistanis once said that they will eat grass in order to build the bomb and the Iranians will do the same thing. But before we get to the bomb, President Obama has a chance to really give it to the Iranians and to show the Iranians the cost of being a brigand state in the world as Charlie has explained. The Iranians are active in Syria. Defeat Iran in Syria. Defeat Iran in Syria. Sever the connection. Like when you, when you look at the Iranians, because of Syria and their position in Syria, they have power and reach all the way to the Mediterranean and Beirut, to Hezbollah and also to Israel. If you want to, dis if you want to give the Iranians a lesson in the realities of power, you destroy their position in Syria. You contest their position in Syria. We don't do so, and then we claim we want to stop Iranian power. It's a fraud. Segment five, why us? Charlie and Fuad, <clears throat> 67 years after the end of the Second World War and 21 years after the end of the Cold War, uh, the, I'm dating it from the collapse of the Soviet Union, we still have 50,000 troops in Germany. Almost seven decades after the end of the Second World War, we don't have that large a troop presence in Japan, but who's responsible for the defense of Japan? And the answer is the United States Pacific Fleet. South Korea, 26,000 troops in South Korea. How many years? 59 years after Dwight Eisenhower achieves an armistice in the Korean War. And South Korea is a rich country which ought to be able to defend itself against people who are starving to death in North Korea. So why do I make a point of this? Because even when we succeed in establishing stable, functioning, flourishing democracies, as we did in Germany, as MacArthur did in Japan, as we did, it took decades, but it got done in South Korea. Even when we succeed, the American military commitment, that is to say the burden on ordinary taxpayers, never, ever ends. And now you two are saying, okay, add to the list Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. You're asking too much. You're just asking too much. Charlie? 
It can't be too much because we're talking about something that is utterly fundamental, that goes to the very foundations of the way we live, the way we think, the way civilization has progressed over years and, and centuries. It's got to come first with defense and with world order. It has to. Nothing else is going to work without that. And only we can do it. And that is looking more and more to be the case. <clears throat> European allies, we have subsidize the European social welfare state so that they do not have to have a defense capability and they have now shown that they don't have one. So it's up to us. We have a navy. No navy can match ours in any sense anywhere in the world. It's a several ocean navy. And yet we're talking about sequestration of the defense can budget. I, it can't, if this so, goes, so the whole thing goes. David Cameron, as David Cameron, the prime minister of Britain, is making grandiose speeches in the House of Commons asking the United States to participate in, in facing down Gaddafi in Libya. As he's doing that, the defense minister in Great Britain is announcing that the last, the only British aircraft carrier will be decommissioned because they can't afford it anymore. At some level, well, how do you, how do you say to, how do you say to me? How do you say to somebody in Kansas, some poor farmer in Kansas, those bastards? Why do we let them get away with Why don't we make the Europeans pay in Syria? Okay, so, excuse me. I actually do feel this, so let me calm down now. Libya, Barack Obama leads from behind. You know what? It worked. He got the Europeans to do something for the first time. He provides materiel, and it worked. So let him try that in Syria as well. Well, you know, Libya is a model of success, if you will, precisely what you said, Peter. I, I actually have you know, reasonable sympathy for Mr. Jones in Duluth, Minnesota, thinking about the American burden in the world. I mean, I understand that. Like when you take a look at NATO, the American budget, the American military budget is three times, three times the combined total of the 27 other nations in NATO. Obviously, the Europeans have to do more. And as Charlie said, we continue to subsidize the welfare state of Europe because the Europeans don't want to pay the burden and don't want to accept that they live in a dangerous world. But we, should, we don't follow them. We don't follow their lead. I suppose I'm just like, I have this idea of America, which I came to this idea of America as a boy in Beirut in the 50s and early 60s before I headed to the United States, where I truly believe in, the, in America being the indispensable nation. I know it's, it sounds costly. I know it sounds grandiose. I know people think that's a jingoistic idea. I know that President Obama has sold a significant portion of the, of the American public that this is an idea we should completely throw overboard. But I still believe in the American burden. I still believe in the ability and the duty of America to defend the kind of world in which we live. I know there are free riders who come along who don't pay their share, but I still believe very much in this American destiny. This is the American century or its chaos. Libya is a case that indicates that it, this can be made to work. As we have talked about earlier, just a moment ago, Egypt can be made to work. As we talked about a moment ago about Iran, it can be made to work because we have these levers of influence. We do not have to see the waters of maritime Asia and of the Persian Gulf taken out of the freedom of the seas. It can be made to work, but only if we have leadership that says, what we've been talking about here, here's a big, big problem. It's as big as the problem of 1947, and we gotta get to work on it, and here's how we're gonna do it. One or two more questions, and then, I, of course, I wanna talk about the campaign, Obama versus Romney. Energy. Every president since Richard Nixon has said that we need to become energy independent. And now, astonishingly enough, what the federal government failed to deliver, technology and free markets appears capable of delivering, particularly with this new technique of hydraulic fracturing. Many people, I, Lord knows I'm not an expert, but I read the newspapers, many people are saying that North America, if you include the Canadian deposits, North America could be energy independent within a decade. Some people say if we're aggressive about it, within five years. How does that change our relationship with the Middle East? 
you can see where I'm going with that because sure. what I want to do is say, ha ha, that <clears> permits <throat> Robinson to indulge his impulse to get the hell out of there. And Charlie won't let me, I'm sure. Uh, I, it pains me to be optimistic, but I think that you are correct about energy. I hear this from people who are expert. George it Schultz telling me about me it. pains me to be optimistic. That's, <laughs> Char that's a Charlieism. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it looks to me as though that what you have just described is probably on its way. And that's going to make us more able to do the things that we need to do. For example, uh, biofuels and the Navy. Big connection there. So that's a reason for thinking that it's not too expensive, it's not hopeless, we can, we can act, we th see things changing and we can make them work okay. for us. Fuad, I heard an interview recently with Fred Smith who founded Federal sure. Express. And he made the point that whenever, for almost 40 years now, the United States gets economic growth, the oil producers and one country in particular extracts value from the American economy. There's the following exchange took place, and he's talking about the future. Quote, this is Fred Smith. If the U.S. gets any significant economic growth, you can count on the price of oil being raised to extract a large share of the value. Close quote. Interviewer says, the oil producers would do that intentionally? Fred Smith replies, of course. There are a lot of smart people in Riyadh. If we want to advance the cause of liberty and our own interests, I mean, Bashar al-Assad is a piker by comparison with the wealth that the Saudis have extracted from the United States. What about fomenting a little liberty movement in Saudi Arabia? Some, for some reason, perhaps there's a good reason, perhaps you're about to explain it to me. For some reason, the Saudis, this medieval monarchy, which is spent by at reputable estimates, billions of dollars exporting Wahhabism, the most extreme form of, of Islam, around the world and raked tens of hundreds of billions of dollars out of the Western economy, for some reason, they're, they're off limits to American policy. You know, the other day I wanted to send a FedEx to Hoover and I went to my neighborhood in, in Manhattan and when the FedEx young man who worked at FedEx, uh, I don't know, he probably works for minimum wage, no benefits, when he told me that the package will cost $68, I was scandalized. And I thought to myself, I need to talk to Fred Smith because at the time he and I were serving on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. I think this is a kind of, it's not really about extorting from us. You know, this is the realities of the marketplace. This is what the marketplace does. They charge what the market will bear. That's, they charge what the market will bear, even though our energy independence will have an impact on my visibility in the world because, you know, I, I am an expert on the Middle East and on Saudi Arabia. I am perfectly happy to welcome your scenario where we become less dependent on the fossil fuels of the Middle East. That's essential to our liberty and that's essential to our independence. As for the, as for the Saudis, they've been really, they've been allies of the Pax Americana, dependents, wards of the Pax Americana for since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, really since the Truman years. We've lived with them. We haven't liked them. They don't like us. We depend, you know, we just have this tolerable relationship with them. Charlie? Uh, don't you want to take a pop at the political Saudis? political systems that are just not sustainable, and the Saudi one is one of those. And they can't keep it up. They can't keep it up. I think that they, in the depths of uh, their slumbers, I think that they recognize that they've got to change. Well, right. look what's happening in Saudi Arabia. You By have the way, there, there, one would suppose there's quite a lot of slumbering going on because they're still passing the monarchy itself among these octogenarian brothers. Exactly. <laughs> they don't I mean, know what else you to ended do. Up, you have the king, a very, very popular monarch, King Abdullah. The present he, king. Yes, exactly. He loses his crown prince, his half-brother, Sultan. He designates another half-brother, Prince Naif, the, you know, as, as crown prince. He dies. He designates another half-brother, Prince Salman, as crown prince, and on, on and on it goes. I mean, the brothers will give the country maximum a decade at best. Then we see what will become of the Saudi world. All right. Fuad Ajami, quote, this brings us to the campaign. This administration, the Obama administration, has done its best to take the vital matter of America's place and interest in the foreign world off the board. 
And the amazing thing is that Mr. Obama's Republican rival, Mitt Romney, cedes him the foreign policy domain, allowing him to pose as though all is well in the world. Close quote. Charlie has said, both of you have said, that in this election, we will either ratify a strategic retreat from the world or stop it. And neither candidate seems capable, neither can I put it to you that neither candidate seems remotely equal to the moment. Charlie? Uh, foreign policy, you know, is never considered to be a big issue in presidential elections. And as you've described, it's not one that's going to be a big one in this election unless what we've been talking about here today is picked up, and it certainly won't be by the president, picked up by the challenger and in a speech puts it to the American people, this is what is at stake. If that's not done, then the voters will go to the polls in November and they won't even be aware of what we're talking about here. There's got to be something, if, if we're to succeed in what we're trying to do, in talking about this, there's got to be some way to put before the public that this is a crucial year in the history of American and world affairs. So, the, broadly speaking, the only message about foreign policy in the campaign so far is that of the Obama administration, which is saying, in effect, I'm wrapping up some sloppy, unnecessary, costly, pointless wars. <laughs> And by the way, I did get Osama bin Laden. I am using drones to kill bad guys. Don't worry. The defense of this country, which is all we as Americans really ought to be worried about, is safe in my hands. And that argument will stand, absent a challenge by Mitt Romney, who, however, has the opportunity to draw upon the innate decency of Americans and say, we still have a role in the world that recognized by both Democratic and Republican presidents, Harry Truman, R Ronald Reagan, right? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Mm. Bill yes. Clinton. Yes. So write the speech for Romney. Well, look, I mean, I think Governor Romney has accepted, if you will, the basic assumption that foreign policy is not a winning proposition. He should not be afraid. He should challenge Barack Obama on the basics. He should challenge him on the retreat of American power. He should challenge him on the unwillingness of the Obama administration to back freedom in the world. He should challenge him in a very interesting way. Now we understand that Governor Romney is going to go to Israel. That's a good move. It shouldn't just be about electoral necessity that it looks good in Florida or Ohio and so on. It should be about that Barack Obama did not go to Israel. He went to Turkey, he went to Cairo, etc., etc. It should be about that we back our allies in the world. I think Governor Romney should be more bold on foreign policy. Never, never concede your rival a whole big domain. He should challenge him on Afghanistan, that record in Afghanistan. He should challenge him on the good war that Barack Obama claims and does not yet claim. And people on the Obama, or I beg your pardon, people on the Romney campaign will say, whoa, 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 whoa. Look what it cost George W. Bush, who left office with the lowest approval rating of any president since Harry Truman, by the way. Look what it cost him. We are just not going to go there. And your answer is? My answer is you have no choice but to go there. Because if, if, if Governor Romney thinks that the world outside is going to oblige and that there will be no crises between now and November that highlight the need for American leadership, and that call upon Governor Romney to describe the world in which we live. You know, Governor Romney doesn't seem particularly articulate. Here we are talking to the man who wrote, you know, famous speeches and so on, and we're talking about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was articulate. Ronald Reagan was articulate. The possibility of electing someone without articulating, without describing the world in which we live seems remote to me. Hmm. Charlie? You're probably right. The Romney campaign will not want their candidate to do this at all. But this is a matter that is of transcendent importance. And it is a moment, it is a year uh, of destiny. And a leader who wants to be a leader of this country and of America as it has been a leader in the past 
should make that speech, and then that would force the president to make his speech, which you have just put in summary. So what I think we need to do is get you to be the speechwriter for right, right, right. Governor Romney. Uh, thank you, Charlie. What have I ever done to you? Mm -hmm. um, all right, last, last round of questions. One sentence of advice. I create a situation. I'm dictator for a day, and I, I permit you. Actually, I'm not dictator. I'm a, I'm a I'm Democrat. A, I'm a, what are those uh, elves, those Irish elves called? Uh, the leprechauns. That, that's it. I'm a leprechaun, and I give you, instead of wishes, I give you sentences. You get to offer one sentence of advice each to President Obama and to Governor Romney. So first, each of you, your one sentence for Barack Obama. Charlie? I would say um, change your style, which has become strident and harsh and accusatory. And I don't think that that's going to last through November successfully with the American people. I would say that President Obama is called upon to be true to the traditions of Roosevelt, Truman, and Kennedy, and Bill Clinton even. And I would remind him that um, Someone like uh, when Bill Clinton did Kosovo, he did it without waiting upon the Russians, without begging the Russians for approval. Be bold and accept the burden of American responsibility. All right. Actually, we've already given advice to sure. Romney. So let me, look, here's the last question. Your word of advice or explanation to the American in Duluth, who's busy sure. raising a family and running his dentist practice or teaching school, democracy is hard work and people are busy leading their lives. So here we are, Iraq sure looked like a mess, Obama's got us out of there. What do you say to the ordinary American in Duluth as they think through the foreign policy aspects of the current presidential campaign. You know, Peter, I don't worry about the average American in Duluth because the average American in Duluth, actually, when all is said and done, though we think he's an isolationist, he sends his son or daughter to West Point. He's very proud of it. He's very proud of the American position in the world. What I worry about are the cultural elites in the great American universities, in the great American media. These are the people. Your neighbors on the Upper West Side. Exactly. These are the people I worry about. I worry about a foreign policy pundit trying to be servile to Barack Obama, I will leave him unnamed, saying we can't intervene in Syria because Syria is a landlocked country when Syria has 180 kilometers of coastline. I worry about those people. But the ordinary American is truly, you know, he, the, these people provide the bedrock of our democracy and our position in the world. Charlie? I agree. It is the, uh, the intelligentsia of America and they've been uh, in seats of power in the media and in the universities um, for a long time now. And I think that their um, control of the mind of America has been slipping. And I see that in young people and students coming forward who have a kind of dual level in how they think of the world. They uh, see the world as they actually see it themselves, but they know what they've been taught and what they've been taught doesn't fit the way the world is. And they are an audience that a speech would reach. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Charles Hill, Dr. Fuad Ajami, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.